So we're going to talk about the Tsar, his government, and then the society. Now we go to the Marxists. And within the Marxists, there are also two wings. Uh, one of them is the uh, Bolsheviks, and the other is the Mensheviks. So that is a huge discussion, but let me just put it in simple ways. In the beginning, there's not much difference between them. Uh, basically, what defines them is that they're Marxists as opposed to being socialist revolutionaries. That is what matters in this time and age. It would be different during the Russian Revolution. The point is that the Marxists believe that capitalism has come to Russia, that's what Lenin wrote in his book, and it is good. The SRs think capitalism came to Russia and it's bad. So that's already a big difference. The SR, they don't like capitalism. They want peasant communes to be happily living together without any capitalism. The Marxists say, oh, great, capitalism has come to Russia. Now we're going to do the revolution. It's going to be a working revolution, working class revolution. They're happy capitalism came to Russia not because they like capitalism, but because now there is a bird we can kill. <laughs> that's the kind of a, a joy for coming of capitalism. Uh, so, they, they, they assembled the first Congress, the all of Russian Marxists, in uh, 1898, uh, and then they're, they're one united, and then in, a, in 1903, they finally split into those two wings, but they continued to be uh, one political party until all the way to 1917, which is called Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party, with the two leadership uh, gravitation poles. One as a faction, the Bolsheviks, led by Vladimir Lenin, and the second one, the Mensheviks, led by Julius Martov, who will later on be the leader of the Menshevik opposition to the Bolshevik rule, which is, uh, we'll get there when we get there, this is my book, The Menshevik Opposition to the Bolsheviks in the Revolutionary Time. So that invites me to speak a little bit about who is Vladimir Lenin, and what exactly he is trying, how is his Marxism really, uh, you know, shaping up? I actually would argue that's not Marxism at all, and try to convince you of that. So Lenin is, uh, is one of those intellectuals, intelligentsia types, very typical. He's uh, in the university, uh, he, he gets into these circles of students who are revolutionary cells, they talk about uh, all kinds of things, materialism and socialism, he reads all the new socialist literature, so popular at the time, follows the writings of Marx and Bakunin and others, and, and, and then there comes a, a moment in his intellectual development where he breaks with the socialist revolutionaries and his famous phrase, we will go the other way. And that is when he embraces Marxism, as I said, not because he really knows much about Marxism, but because Marxism says capitalism is going to be destroyed by the proletarian revolution. So this is, for Lenin, Marxism is an intellectual salvation as to how you could actually do a revolution, rather than killing the czars. He doesn't believe that terrorist activities is any good, it's useless. Uh, instead of Alexander II, you have Alexander III, nothing changed, another Alexander. And then there'll be another one. He basically teaches you have to raise the masses for the proletarian revolution. So he does not like capitalism, but he welcomes capitalism. Now, it's also important in his personal biography is that his brother, he had a brother, Alexander, who was caught in, a, in, a, in an attempt to, to make a bomb. And so he was a member of these underground cells. And, and he was executed. And so uh, it, was, uh, it was a big blow. Uh, and they say, I don't know, but the psychological historians kind of say that it kind of shook him up. Whether this was the cause or not, but the absolute fact about Lenin is that he hated the Tsarist regime profoundly, deeply, with a powerful force. He hated it, hated it so much that he would be actually destroying it to the foundation and be very happy in the process of destroying it. Uh, now, was he actually a Marxist? Uh, 
Let me now argue to you that he was not. Uh, you know, Marxism, the key idea of Marxism, other than that it's exploitation of workers and the critique of capitalism, where all that stuff is true Marxism, and most socialists would agree with all this critique. But, but then Marx says that capitalism is a historical stage in the development of mankind. And you cannot rush it. You know, there are these forces of production that develop to a certain point, and only then, when they develop to a certain point, they will kind of outlive and overthrow the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. It would only happen when the, the, they're ripe for it, when they're ready for it. And they're ready for it when capitalism reaches a stage of monopoly capital when there are more workers than capitalists and more means of production that are already in public domain that they would just kick out the capitalists as useless and irrelevant toy that, that has out, outlived its usefulness. That's kind of like the logic of Marxist stages of history. Socialism will come by itself without even you notice it. And in a way, that is what happened in Western Europe. You know, it sort of turned socialism by socialist by providing the benefits for the working class uh, and the bourgeoisie sort of becomes uh, irrelevant because the government is in the hands of a majority of working people like it is in Sweden, Germany, France and other countries. Now for Lenin, he decided to do a shortcut. We are not going to wait until Russia is ripe. We're going to make Russia ripe. So his whole contribution, so-called contribution to so-called Marxism, is that he reversed the Marxist equation that you have a stage of history and then the working class grows to it to overthrow the bourgeoisie. He says, no, no, no. We are going to create a party of professional revolutionaries. We're going to seize power by force. And then we're going to institute socialism top down which is totally and profoundly un-Marxist. If Marx had heard this, he would have probably said, this is my rendition of what Marx would have said, you are worse than Bakunin. You're an anarchist, worse than Bakunin. You know nothing about uh, stages of history, about Hegel, about dialectical materialism. You have not understood anything at all about what I wrote because that cannot be, that's not Marxism. That's voluntarism, that's anarchism, that has nothing to do with what I tried to show about the development of capitalism. That is what I think Marx would have said. So I do agree with Marx, yes. I think that this reversal of first we're going to seize power and then we're going to make socialism is not Marxist. Now, it may work for a while and, and it sort of did work, but it's just not Marxism. So in one of my lectures, I call Lenin an SR spy in the, in the Marxist movement. So that is profoundly a way of thinking of a socialist revolutionary. You kill the czar, you seize power, and then you start doing this nice socialist reform. In any case, uh, in any book on, on Lenin, you would see that in his pamphlet, What is to be done? That is his contribution to Marxism. This is what makes Marxism into Marxism hyphen Leninism. To create a party of professional revolutionaries who are going to seize power and then overturn the society top down in a kind of revolution from above by establishing the dictatorship of the proletariat. Of course, what he critics would say that it's not going to be dictatorship of the proletariat, it's going to be his dictatorship and his party's dictatorship substituting the dictatorship of the working class. And that's exactly what happened, and that's exactly what Martov and the Mensheviks will accuse him of when we get to the Russian Revolution. In any case, so that's the, the spectrum of Russian political parties in the, in the first Duma. The important thing for this period is that it is free elections. Russia is having a practicable democracy. Uh, it is pretty much an open vote and Communist Party newspaper, it's not called Communist, it's called Bolshevik at that time, is openly published. Pravda is, is, is published openly in the, in the uh, available uh, domain. At the same time, the secret police uh, is, is at work and they are trying to, which they should, catch the terrorists. Uh, 
And so they are infiltrating these revolutionary cells. And Lenin, just like his SR heritage suggests, uh, is very much with one side a public figure, with the other side the Bolsheviks also have, just like the SRs, they have a terrorist wing. And what they really want to do is rob banks and, and uh, raise money and do all kinds of other weird stuff, such as marry some nice Bolshevik girls to some merchants so that they could you know, milk them for money and do all kinds of things like this. And by the way, the hitman who was in, in charge of some of the bank robberies was the future comrade Stalin. He, he was in 1907 involved in one of those bank robberies for the party. Lenin actually is very Machiavellian. Anything goes for the revolution. Bank robbery, murder, you know, a conspiracy, a sort of fake marriage. It, as long as it's to serve the liberation of the working class, you know, who cares? We're going to liberate the working class, even if it takes a few broken jaws, as, as he would say. So it's quite cynical, actually. But in any case, uh, that is what is uh, happening. And then when the revolution subsides in 1907, he leaves, he goes abroad, and this is where he was going to remain until 1917. He lives, oh gosh, where did he not live? In Paris, in Zurich, in Warsaw, in London, you know, all over the place. Uh, basically lived on the money of coming from Russia, from the revolutionary cells. And they would come and visit him and he would do instructions and so forth. But in any case, uh, he would not have been even remembered as a footnote to the history of Russia if it hadn't been for the cataclysmic events that would shake the world with the coming of World War I. Uh, but before World War I, the years from 1907 to 1914 were really, really good. Uh, they were 8 9% growth rate, uh, very fast modernization, direct investment. As I told you, France and Germany tried to outdo each other who is going to invest in Russia more. Uh, it, it, was, it was unbelievable um, growth of the economy. And, and also things were kind of like coming to fruition in many other respects. As I told you uh, last time, the peasant cooperatives led by the socialist revolutionaries pretty much bought up all the noble land that was to buy. I mean, they were literally transforming the countryside in peasant-held um, the peasant-held uh, production. There were many other social changes. I mean, there were many studies done that I don't want to get into detail too much for you, but uh, it shows that Russian army, for example, had about 70% were peasant upstarts. The generals in World War I, they were all peasant sons, and they made it through the ranks and they became uh, generals. So it, it's, it's not uh, correct to think that Russia was run by landlords and capitalists and, and the old regime it, it was not. Russia was changing very fast. Uh, and perhaps one of the reasons for this you know, turmoil of the revolution was the speed of change rather than the lack of change. It was changing dramatically uh, with, with the uh, growing cities, growing uh, factories and, and new um, industrial capacity that was being built. However, there was a problem. Uh, and the problem was with the government, uh, and the government was not cohesive. The Tsar did not like either the Duma or his government. He distrusted them, and he reluctantly tolerated them. And he was not very decisive and didn't know how to respond to crises. And one of them, uh, maybe you recall when we did uh, 10th grade, we had a Nikki Willy correspondence which showed, you know, indecisiveness of, of Nicholas. Here's the situation. The Archduke Ferdinand is killed, and Russia could be dragged into a war. And, and he always kept saying, I am the boss, you know, I am the czar, I am the autocrat. If you are an autocrat, you, you are free to, to do what is right, and what is right is not to get involved in the war, as his intention is apparent from these letters. Do not get involved into a catastrophic war. So what he could have done? Well, he could have called the meeting of the three emperors with the Austrian uh, and with Franz Josef 
and with Wilhelm. It could have it could have said, look, you know, I have we have to punish the terrorists. I can't. My public opinion needs that you punish the terrorists because my father was killed by the terrorists. So he can easily play the game that that the terrorists should be punished, but not Serbia as a country. Uh, he could have tried to keep peace. Instead, you know, he, this whole incident shows how weak he is. He says, my public opinion demands that we go to war, or something like this. It's ridiculous. If you are the czar, you know, forget the public opinion. Tell them, I am the czar, and I don't want to go to war. Something like this. But he didn't. He kind of let Russia be drawn into this defense of, of, of Serbia, no matter what. Now, the other thing, of course, talking about foreign affairs, we already discussed it last time. The alliance with, with France was, was, was actually did more harm than good because it made Germans paranoid about being attacked and their war plans were to destroy France first and then confront Russia. And this is because, and the Russian generals, knowing that that's probably what's gonna happen, they had their own plan to attack Germany first so that they wouldn't have time to prepare and mobilize. So the, the war plans were made to attack East Prussia as soon as the war starts. And of course, these people, not only in Russia, but everywhere in Europe, they had no idea what they were getting into. They absolutely were so stupid to stumble into a war that was their undoing, that was their catastrophe. Um, I'm not gonna talk about uh, World War I now because that's pretty much the beginning of the Russian Revolution. And it's probably one of the greatest causes uh, of it. But let me just sum up the, the most important things about it. How can we judge? Was Russia ripe for the revolution? Or was Russia a kind of a, a fast developing, healthy society that could have avoided the revolution? And again, there are two schools of thought on this. There, if you take history books and start reading one after another on the Russian revolution, there'll be those who would say Russia is backward, it's rotten, it's corrupt, it's underdeveloped, it's poor, it has no electricity, it has illiterate peasants, uh, and of course it's going to have a revolution. If you take other also Western schools, they would argue that Russia was doing just fine. It was number five industrial power in the world, which is not bad. It, it had a, you know, an amazing growth rate of close to 10% every year. Uh, it had a healthy growing population. Uh, it had healthy farms that produced tons of grain for export. Uh, it had a healthy industry. It was the most advanced industry in Europe. Uh, only Germany had more advanced. And the way things were going, they were going better and better and better all the time. But on the other hand, it had a kind of an incohesive government where you had the Duma that's westernizers and the Tsar that's a Slavophile that don't see eye to eye. There's a kind of discord among them. And you also had very a big kind of cleft or uh, misunderstanding between the educated society that was really separate from the peasants and didn't really like them. They kind of despised them as uneducated brutes, these westernizers who would have you know, Western apartments and Western furniture and, and speak French or German or English. And they were kind of looking down at the peasants as some kind of a backward, you know, folks out there in the, in the stupid villages. So there was not enough cohesiveness indeed. But again, look, there's not much cohesiveness in the United States today. And yet nobody thinks there's going to be a revolution tomorrow. So I would say that by any objective measure, Russia was okay. It had problems, and serious ones, but it was not on the verge of collapse. And therefore, it's kind of a so extraordinarily interesting to interpret and see why actually did it collapse when it did collapse in 1917.